Welcome to this video analysing a consumer's report by Peter Porter. Let's hear the poem read all the way through. The name of the product I tested is Life. I have completed the form you sent me and understand that my answers are confidential. I had it as a gift. I didn't feel much while using it. In fact, I think I'd have liked to be more excited. It seemed gentle on the hands, but left an embarrassing deposit behind. It was not economical, and I've used much more than I thought. I suppose I have about half left, but it's difficult to tell. Although the instructions are fairly large, there are so many of them, I don't know which to follow, especially as they seem to contradict each other. I'm not sure such a thing should be put in the way of children. It's difficult to think of a purpose for it. One of my friends says it's just to keep its maker in a job. Also, the price is much too high. Things are piling up so fast. After all, the world got by for a thousand million years without this. Do we need it now? Incidentally, please ask your man to stop calling me the respondent. I don't like the sound of it. There seems to be a lot of different labels. Sizes and colours should be uniform. The shape is awkward. It's waterproof, but it's not heat resistant. It doesn't keep, yet it's very difficult to get rid of. Whenever they make it cheaper, they tend to put less in. If you say you don't want it, then it's delivered anyway. I'd agree it's a popular product. It's got into the language. People even say they're on the side of it. Personally, I think it's overdone. A small thing people are ready to behave badly about. I think we should take it for granted. If its experts are called philosophers or market researchers or historians, we shouldn't care. We are the consumers and the last law makers. So, finally, I'd buy it. But the question of a best buy, I'd like to leave until I get the competitive product you said you'd send. So it could be interpreted that Peter Porter is reflecting on the meaning of life and he's using the idea of consumerism to exemplify this through the extended metaphor of the consumer's report, the consumer's report reporting on life itself. A consumer's report is something that reviews or tests a product, in this case, life. The whole poem is an extended metaphor comparing life to a product. Porter is suggesting that life has become commodified. He is perhaps attempting to reclaim the language from the corporate world. Here, he is using a metaphor to describe the form, meaning the structure of the poem, as an actual form, a document to be filled in. This is quite an interesting, um, humorous playing with poetry. Um, and he does talk about this a lot if you do some research on his style. He's quite a playful poet. It could be deemed ironic that he's talking about this as confidential, these um, kind of reports that businesses, companies would, would require you to test their products, they will always say, your answers are confidential and we will not share your answers with anyone. However, of course they're not confidential really, are they? Because the company themselves are going to be talking about everybody's answers to their, their consumers' reports in their boardrooms and are going to be sharing that knowledge to improve or sell more products. So the idea of any of this type of form or product being confidential is um, a bit ridiculous. So the first and only stanza after the short introduction stanza um, starts with, I had it as a gift. Now perhaps he's talking about a gift from God or a gift from his parents. Um, in the third line of the main stanza of the poem, he says that he would have preferred to have been more excited in his life. Um, so perhaps he's talking about the mundanity of life, boredom. Um, perhaps he struggled with depression. Um, if you do a bit of research into Peter Porter's life, I know he went to a pretty terrible boarding school, really hated it. 
and actually tried to commit suicide on several occasions. So I definitely think he has a very unique perspective um, on life and um, he's sort of questioning the purpose of life in this poem. He talks about life not being very economical. Now we could interpret this um, in terms of the length of his life. Uh, he didn't have a short life. He's writing this as a slightly older man. Um, but it could also be talking about how life is quite costly, perhaps financially is what we would think of in the modern day, but perhaps also um, another way of looking at the term cost would be um, the suffering that we go through as life throws a lot of obstacles and difficult moments at us. There's a few examples throughout the poem of parenthesis, and I feel the voice kind of changes here. This is a continuation of the main stanza. I just didn't have enough space on the page to put the entire poem. So this is not a separate stanza. Uh, the entire poem, pretty much, apart from those first few lines, are one continuous stanza. It's quite a conversational tone to the whole thing. It's not written in any kind of traditional poetic structure. Um, and so we could call the poem free verse with a conversational style. Uh, at the start here, he says that um, the instructions for life are fairly large. Um, so again, we're seeing that commodification of life, almost coming with an instruction manual, perhaps from our parents, from society, from our teachers. People tell us how to live our lives. They give us instructions. But how to live the best life is an enormous philosophical question that people have been asking since ancient Greece. These instructions that we are told as we grow up are often contradictory. They often don't make any sense. Life, he isn't sure if it should be put in the way of children. Now, this could mean he's debating having children, the ethical implications of having children. He then continues to use humour in this poem, where he says one of his friends tells him that life's just to keep its maker in a job. Now, the maker of life we could interpret as God. There's a bit of ambiguity in the following line where he says the price of life is too high. Now, of course, this could relate again to economic cost. The price of living is expensive. Uh, however, he could also be talking about the price we pay for living, which is death. And perhaps he's saying the price for life being death is too high. It's too much pain. He then mentions that things are piling up so fast. And if you studied the other poem, uh, The Planners by Bowie Kim Cheng, you'll remember how he talked about the piling will not stop um, during the building of Singapore. So perhaps it's an allusion to the Industrial Revolution. Perhaps it's an allusion to population growth. He then goes on to talk about how humans, and not just humans, all life forms, are relatively new to planet Earth. And so perhaps this is a reminder for us not to become too arrogant and think that we are the centre of the universe, because of course we are not. And again, we get this example of parenthesis once more. And this is just another little interjection from the author. He says, incidentally, please tell your man to stop calling me the respondent. I don't like the sound of it. Um, and I suppose um, it's because he himself, in writing this report of life, has become uh, known as the respondent. So he himself feels commodified or used as a product. And this continues into the next couple of lines, uh, this idea of being labelled as something. He says, in life, there are many labels. We're all told to be a certain thing. From the minute we're born, really, we might be told to be a strong man or a sweet girl. We might be considered straight or gay or an immigrant or an expat or a socialist or a capitalist. You might be labelled crazy or fat or stupid or beautiful or dumb or popular. All of these labels serve to divide us and create polarisation and destruction. And perhaps what he's saying here is forget these labels. We are all humans and we are all alive. 
then he continues to use this extended metaphor. It's kind of a metaphor within the extended metaphor where he talks about the container of life, the human body. And he says that it's waterproof because your skin is waterproof. If you go outside naked in the rain, um, your skin will keep you dry on the inside. Um, but you're not heat resistant. If you sit in the sun too long without any sun cream, you will burn. So he's saying that we're quite fragile, I suppose. And he's using a bit of humor, again, to compare our bodies to uh, like a waterproof coat or some kind of uh, other product. He then says it doesn't keep. Now, this is a kind of idiom. It's an idiomatic phrase. It doesn't keep. It means that um, if you put some food in the fridge, for example, put some meat in the fridge, it might keep for a week, two weeks. But after about a month or a couple of months, unless you freeze it, it won't keep. It'll go rotten. And so he's comparing the human body to something that ripens, goes wrinkly, becomes old, decays and eventually dies. It's also very difficult to get rid of. Um, you can't go around killing people. You can't kill yourself. These are things that um, are not healthy options um, unless you're a fascist dictator. Uh, so he was kind of ahead of his time, actually, because after this period, we saw the rise of fascism in Europe through multiple dictators and elsewhere in the world. And uh, perhaps he is making a really interesting prediction here about how people won't value life, uh, which is what we saw in World War Two, where many lives, depending on your ethnicity, where you're from, um, life wasn't valued because you were labeled as a particular thing. And then finally, towards the end of this part of the poem, um, he says, People are on the side of it. People are on the side of life. People like life. It is a beautiful thing and it should be cherished. And uh, we are lucky to be alive. We're able to love nature, adventure and all things great. Um, and so perhaps life doesn't need a purpose or a meaning. Perhaps life is just an experience. And uh, perhaps one of Peter Porter's messages after the depression and despair and suicidal feelings he felt, he's actually telling his reader now, embrace the experience of life and just enjoy it. He then goes on to continue his humorous um, tone where he says, personally, I think it's overdone. You know, life's hyped up too much. He then goes on to say, I think we should take it for granted. Don't take life so seriously. Um, this could be ironic, you know, and again, perhaps we will preserve life, and reduce conflict, if we take everything a little bit less seriously. He then goes on to talk about the experts of life, philosophers, market researchers, historians, the people who examine life and define what life's all about. And he says, forget those people, forget that. Normal people should decide what life's really all about. This is continued in the final few lines where he says, we are the consumers and the last law makers. We are the consumers and the last law makers. So if we are the consumers of life, shouldn't we be the ones that govern its meaning? And then finally, he gives us his verdict, his conclusion. He says, finally, I would buy it. So he decides to choose life in the end. So it's a fairly optimistic ending. And then the very, very last line of the poem is, in my opinion, a final allusion to God and the afterlife. We cannot really know if there's a competitive life after this one. So he's saying, I would buy life, but the question of a best buy, which is the best life, I'd like to leave until I get the competitive product you said you'd send. And so perhaps he won't know until his life comes to a natural end, whether this life was the best one or the next life is even better. Well, that's the conclusion to this brief summary. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, please feel free to comment your ideas and your opinions on anything I've said. Perhaps you have some other perspective that you'd like to share. That would be really cool. Uh, of course, this is just my interpretation. Goodbye.